Friends, dear friends, please take a seat. And if you're not familiar with a French, um, Spanish or English, please take a headphone outside. We will start in half a minute. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, we are in the, here in the Sun Nutrition Hub, so we do it a little bit more informal, and that's not the most important, we do it more interactive, because in these events, we also want to hear from you. Not long statements, but questions, comments, etc. 
We have today an uh, exciting topic, but also a very important topic. It is what can we learn from each other when it comes to tackling all forms of malnutrition? And what can we learn from each other? Then we mean from country to country, because malnutrition is um, a strong hinder for implementing uh, the Sustainable Development Goals and reaching good development for your country. And if you do nutrition well, you lay a strong foundation for improving everything in your country and implementing the Sustainable Development goal, Goals, meanwhile making uh, economic uh, progress and uh, economic growth. We have an exciting, uh, exciting panel, but before I introduce them to you, I will tell you that I will be a nice moderator until you take the floor for too long, or in case uh, from country delegations, more than one delegate member will take the floor. So if you are a delegation representing a country, uh, make sure that only one of the delegation members is taking the floor. We want to have interaction, but we first invite um, Madam Sanja Nishtar, who is one of the co-chairs of the High-Level Commission on Obesity and Non-Communicable Diseases to set the scene. Sanja Nishtar, we, it's an honor to have you here, um, and we're looking forward to your setting the scene. So good afternoon, uh, everybody, and uh, welcome to the Sun Nutrition Hub. Um, of course, I, uh, I, I wear several hats, and I am, of course, the commission uh, co-chair, but I'm also a member of, your, of the Sun Lead group. Uh, so essentially, this is my home, and I have pleasure in welcoming all of you along with uh, our very dynamic uh, leader here. Um, I want to be very brief, but I just want to uh, bring to bear the importance of the work that Sun does, uh, and I just want to talk very briefly about two things. I want to go back 20, a few years back in time uh, to the Planning Commission of Pakistan, where at the end of a very dark corner, we had a room which said Nutrition Division. And I recall each one of us, you know, when I was, whether I was in the cabinet or in the civil society, or we really didn't know where nutrition belonged because health didn't want to own it um, completely. Uh, education didn't want to own it completely. The other ministries didn't want to own it completely. And nutrition was always an outlier because we didn't know where it belonged. And since Sun has established its operations, for lack of a better word, we have seen a remarkable change in my country. A few weeks ago, I was at the local chapter meeting of Sun in Pakistan. And in a room as big as this, we had virtually every sector represented. Every sector that had an interplay with the nutrition agenda was, was represented in the room. There was the Ministry of Health, the Ministry of Education, Ministry of Science, Ministry of Information Technology. There were digital experts, um, people who worked in the IT space. There were college students, college principals, there were academics, there were civil society representatives, INGO representatives, and each one of them knew that the nutrition agenda is a multi-sectoral agenda. Each one of them knew that they have to sit together to find solutions, and each one of them was completely sold onto the idea that this agenda is about collaborative division of labor, and about unified metrics and joint, account, uh, joint accountability. And this transformation that Sun has led in terms of creating the right institutional architecture, at least in my country, is something that I know happens in other settings as well. And I want to thank you, Gerda, and your team uh, for, for ushering in this transformation. Uh, that's the first point uh, I wanted to make to reiterate the importance of why you're here uh, and, and the value of what you will take away from these conversations and convenings. 
The second thing that I think is important in terms of what Sun has been able to get up and running in terms of awareness creation, in terms of uh, catalyzing policy, in terms of catalyzing implementation, is the realization that the malnutrition agenda is not only about undernutrition. We have a double burden of malnutrition with obesity and overweight at one end of the spectrum and undernutrition at the extreme on the uh, uh, other end of the spectrum and micronutrient deficiency somewhere in the middle. In many countries, in, in resource poor settings, in the same homes we see this double burden, very evident, very prevalent. So you will see in a classical Pakistani home, a man who has central obesity, the wife with, uh, with diabetes who's grossly obese, you will see children who are malnourished, and of course you will see stunting in the neighborhood. So it is not enough for us just to focus on the undernutrition end of the spectrum. It is absolutely critical that we um, focus on the overweight and obesity end of the spectrum as well. There are clearly many synergies. Uh, I'm sure you know that obesity is a complex multidimensional problem. There are important epigenetic influences interplaying with the obesogenic environment, uh, and that there is significant potential to intervene through common interventions such as preconception care, better management of gestational diabetes, uh, keeping a watch on the mother's weight, uh, promotion of breastfeeding, um, you know, um, uh, nutrition literacy as far as caregiver, school health, so on and so forth. So, so they have a shared agenda to a very large extent, but of course some interventions are unique at the overweight and obesity end of the spectrum. So I just want to, uh, in a nutshell, uh, you know, as you kick off this discussion, I just wanted to thank you, Gerda, and your team uh, for the important work that you're doing. And I just wanted to bring to bear the, the salience of how it hits the ground in countries in terms of establishing the multisectoral arrangements that are needed and in signaling the importance of attention both to undernutrition as well as overweight and obesity. I know that you are a tough moderator and I'm scared that you may, you may cut me off. So let me hand you back the floor and thank you once again for having me here. Thank you so much. The truth is I was smiling at her, um, but she didn't want me to get into the next uh, uh, phase because um, that is what we uh, want uh, to hear. We are all here to learn and to share uh, from each other and we have a very rich panel. I'm extremely uh, um, happy to see here a doctor, welcome here, Dr. Stanek Zar, who is the senior advisor to the Minister of Health in Afghanistan. And Afghanistan, we all, have our, we all know how uh, complicated, like in many other countries, the situation is out there. But Afghanistan came, became a member of the Sun uh, Movement. Please take already a microphone. Um, it became a member of the Sun Movement in October last year. And they said, we want to fight undernutrition, stunting, wasting, but we also have a prevalence of uh, obesity of 20%. And we want to tackle both, and we'd like to uh, take the approach. Please stand up, because that is how we address uh, the people here. Um, you know what you're talking about. I'll give you a microphone, and you have about three minutes to um, uh, elaborate a little bit about the biggest barriers you see in uh, barriers you see in your country to tackle undernutrition, stunting, wasting, and obesity and NCDs at the same time, and what you want to take away from this event to be inspired by others. You have the floor. <coughs> okay. Uh, close to you, your close Madam to your mouth. Chair, close to your mouth. And gentlemen, colleagues from you know Sun, from WHO, from civil society, and delegates from Afghanistan, I'm very delighted to be today part of this very important meeting. And also, I would like to consider the limitation of the time. I would like to highlight the key issues that you mentioned. As you all know, Afghanistan made a significant progress to tackle the issues of nutrition, particularly the uh, chronic malnutrition, also the acute malnutrition, as well as you know, malnutrition among the pregnant mothers during their life of uh, reproductive health. 
But the important thing is that, you know, despite of all the efforts since two decades, we have succeeded to only reduce the chronic malnutrition 20%. We had 60% of our children under five were chronically malnourished. And our uh, children are also suffering of acute malnutrition and the rate is around 9.0%, uh, which is very high. But the problem is that we do not succeed to reduce the acute malnutrition. But we succeeded to reduce acute malnutrition from 60% to 40%, which is not enough. We need to do more and more. And there are a lot of issues that is, you know, a, as a barrier in front of us that are not enabling us to reach the full target. There are many reasons. First, Afghanistan is a conflict country. Right now, there is conflict is going on, but in the same time, there is development going, going on. This is one issue. And also, the other issue is that you know, the health services in Afghanistan are contracted out, and our countries completely depend on the external uh, resources. We are receiving most of our resources for the provision of essential health services from the donor communities. Though we tried all our best to streamline this, the, the, the priorities of donors in line with the priorities of the people of Afghanistan, especially the Ministry of Health of Afghanistan. But still, there are issues I would like to clearly highlight it here for your consideration. First, the vertical projects that are coming to Afghanistan, though we are all trying to inline their uh, you know, efforts with our priorities, they are to some level, to some extent flexible, but not completely. And when the project is completed, everything is going to collapse. I will give you one example. We had a very successful, uh, successful project that you know, started to address the chronic malnutrition, especially for children under five and also for children under two. And we developed a very uh, you know, practical tool because the literacy rate is very low in Afghanistan, so we cannot you know, use these uh, materials, written material, all these. So we have to adapt the tools. We adapted a, a pictorial tools, which was very practical, very useful at the community level. And we address the children under one, under two, and also the reproductive age mothers. And we you know, expanded this uh, uh, activity from uh, zero you know, to 15, and then to 16 districts in Afghanistan. But while the project completed, this, everything collapsed. Everything removed. So what is my uh, message to the international community, especially to SAN, that we have to focus also from WHO, my request is that, that any project is going to complete or to over, the, the next project or the next uh, fund uh, period should consider and you know, build upon what is already achieved from that project. They should not start from the scratch. This is the main message from my side. And this is the main reason why we are not, why we are not able, why you are not asking me that why Afghanistan is not able to reduce it from 40% down. Why we are in stacking, where, where is there, why there is stagnation. There are reasons behind. So one reason could be that, you know, I, you know that the, the donor communities, are, I don't want to take the name, but you know, all donors and the international NGOs should help us that, you know, before to you know, start any uh, new project, they have to review the situation and take the lessons learned from the uh, you know, experience of the completed project and then build upon that. If you are going to complete and build upon the project that we you know, implemented three, four years back, now we would be to cover almost 80 or 60 percent of the country. But you know, that project, which was very successful, that implemented the community-based you know, growth monitoring and promotion was very successful, but it collapsed. So this is my request, and also the international community have to pay more attention to those countries that they are, you know, uh, need more attention. And they should be considered equity, not the equality. Afghanistan is one of the countries that they deserve your attention, deserve your support to address malnutrition in children, in mothers, and also in the girls in the school. So thank you very much. I have a lot of issues to share, but I'm going to stop because to consider the time limit. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much. You see, you spoke from the heart and you, oh, yes. spoke, uh, you spoke very passionate. No, 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 sit down here. Relax a little bit because I'm, I'm quite sure that people will have some, uh, some questions uh, for you. But first, uh, a relax, uh, very, very uh, clear message. Alignment. Um, coherent and learn the lessons of, of, the, of the program very well in order to build 
on this and to make it not only sustainable but also durable. Thank you so much. Well, now uh, I'm happy to invite Madam uh, Alma Golden. Um, she is the Deputy Assist, uh, Assistant Administrator of USAID and uh, USAID is a great supporter of the uh, Sun Movement and is embracing the multi-sectoral and multi-stakeholder approach that we have in uh, under nutrition. But we know, for instance, that your country is also dealing with um, quite a challenge when it comes to obesity and NCDs. So could you answer or could you elaborate a little bit on two answers? Do you think on two topics? Do you think that the multi-sectoral, multi-stakeholder approach um, in some movement uh, countries for the multiple burden can be maintained and strengthened? And how would you think that the United States could overcome this through a multi-sectoral, multi-stakeholder approach? And what would you like to share, Ian? So how many of you think you can do that in three minutes, okay? <laughs> thank you so much. Oh, okay. And thank you also for the good lunch. That was setting a good pattern for us. That was we very nice. We thank you. We were very proud okay. of you. Like, is that better? Close to your mouth. Almost kiss the micro. Okay. This one. Okay. Is that better? All right. Thank you so much. Um, I want to talk about both of those very different topics, but I want to time together with one word, and that's relationship. Because uh, if you look at what we're doing in the multi-sectorial approaches in the U.S. government, we have a coordination pattern that's been in process now for four years. And what we do uh, about once a month, or, or actually about every two weeks now, is we actually do a complete report of priority areas where nutrition is a big issue. And we bring together all of the uh, sub-agencies inside of the United States Agency for International Development, including our humanitarian response, our uh, agricultural group and our health related nutrition people and we all review along with the folks from the Department of Agriculture and an economics group and also uh, also other interested agencies and we'll bring together a report around a particular country where we have a priority issue and that allows all of us to look at the same information at the same time with a video conference okay Okay. I, I'm, okay, with a video conference that actually connects us to the capital of the country that we're, we're actually uh, reviewing. So for instance, if we're talking about Senegal, we have an opportunity to talk about agriculture, health, economics, trade, and education all at the same time. And that allows a, for a good plan to go forward that we all agree upon, comment on and agree upon, so that we can work together to develop the relationships, the planning, and actually the execution and implementation of a, of a multi-sectoral approach. It's been very effective and it's been very, very interesting to do. Now I'm going to transition over to the United States. We certainly have many challenges related to our NCDs. We have problems with obesity, and as many of you know, like other developed countries, we also have problems with just eating disorders as well. It's, as a pediatrician, which is my background, um, I, I have been watching the issues around childhood obesity for a very long time. And there's one trend that we're starting to try to look at more closely in the United States. And that is the relationship between family eating patterns and actual obesity or other health discrepancies. For instance, we've known for about 15 years that third graders who have meals with their family five to seven times a week have not only better vocabularies and better connections to their parents, they have lower rates of obesity. We're start, starting to see some similar patterns also for adolescents that in terms of improved activity levels, sense of connection, and knowledge and use of, of appropriate nutrition. So one of the areas we're looking at is one of the areas you're like, now see, I'm from Texas. People don't usually have to tell me to talk slower. So. No, but then I'll take the blame and I will be nice for you. I will be nice with you for one half minute longer. So please talk yes. slow. Okay. Okay. Um, bottom line, we're looking at how, what are some uh, nutrition alternatives that 
truly take in healthy foods, but also address the context in which we consume food so that we're looking at how to eat foods in a nutritious food in a supported positive environment and also like without television, without screen time at the same time and that also incorporates the value of a family being active or a community being active so that you're, we're building in supported healthy lifestyles throughout the, the lifespan. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. And I'm, I'm quite sure there will be some questions. No, 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 you shouldn't escape. Just find a seat, relax a little bit because um, we will open up. Uh, it's about relationship. It is br about bringing the people uh, together and make them work or make them eat together and pay attention to each other. Important uh, uh, message, important part of the, um, of the uh, solution. Then I'm very happy and honored to introduce Gunnild Stordale. She is the chair of the, the president of, and the founder of the EAT Foundation and um, equally important, she's a member of the Sun uh, Movement Lead Group. And um, Gunnild, we are curious whether you could uh, give us a sneak preview of the outcomes of the EAT Lancet uh, commi Commission, who uh, that is dealing with healthy diets and what each of the stakeholders of the players has to do with it. The other burning question we'd like you to start to answer is private sector. Yesterday morning, we had a breakfast with six ministers around the table and several other uh, people. And we were missing desperately the role of the private sector or the voice of the private sector. And the private sector needs to be part of the solution. Could you talk um, in a reasonable speed, <laughs> but with your with your usual passion for, let's say, three and a half, maybe four minutes on these two topics. You have the floor. Thank you so much. I think it's not working, but maybe you can hear me. Ah. Yeah. I, I, you know, the Norwegians are, uh, they are known to be like... This, this one is about, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much, Gerda, for hosting this important event and for letting me talk uh, a little bit about uh, the science behind this because if we I think we all agree that food health and sustainability are like the three musketeers is one for all and all for one and food is interlinked to almost everything and unless we get it right on food we are not going to achieve the SDGs and we won't have a chance to reach Paris either so the question that actually made me start the EAT Foundation in the, in the beginning was how should we provide healthy diets to a growing world population without destroying the planet along the way? And where is the science? I wanted some science-based targets, like we have for uh, climate. Obviously, the reason we are now moving forward in the right direction on climate is because we have a less than two degree targets that the world has agreed to achieve. But for food systems, there is no such target. So the Eat Lancet Commission is the first attempt to actually assess what's out there, or the science. What is healthy diets? And what is sustainable food production? And how, what does it look like if we say, okay, close to 10 billion people need healthy diets within environmental safe limits? So this commission is obviously the first stepping stone. It will require a lot more uh, research and work, but it's a, is a, a, a step in the right direction and provides a framework for stakeholders from the health, the environmental community in particular to come together and address food systems. And in short, it shows that we need a radical transformation of the global food system, a reboot. We need to start producing what we actually need from a public health and an environmental uh, perspective. And this is also what makes this feasible for, for some countries. So how can we bring then stakeholders together to address these uh, challenges in a way that is win-win? Win-win diets is what we need to see. And obviously, 
having said that, one of, one of the, the, the conclusions from the Commission, which I can share with you, is that we will need to see a radical shift in diets towards mostly plant-based or alternative protein diets at a global level. But it's 50 shades of red. When it comes to meat, high-income countries, for example, my own, Norway, will have to do much more and also help other countries to achieve that because in certain parts of the world, uh, many some countries will actually see that their meat consumption will have to increase. So this is, uh, it's not black or white, it's uh, 50 shades of red, as I say. And then to private sector. Uh, private sector produces almost all the food in the world and obviously it's a key part of the problem but that's why it's a key part of the solution. But we need to acknowledge that the food system challenges is a system failure. We cannot expect the private industry to do everything alone without enabling policies, comprehensive enabling policies from governments that actually makes it profitable to produce and, and serve and uh, distribute what we need. It won't happen. So that is why the Eat Lancet Commission really bring uh, a framework for stakeholders to get behind. And one example is the fresh partnership with World Business Council for Sustainable Development, which 40 uh, of the biggest global companies in the food space uh, are now working to develop business solutions um, based on this framework, because they see that the science is actually inside information for the private sector. The demand will have to come along healthy diets from sustainable food systems. And that framework will also obviously be um, a basis for accountability mechanisms such as uh, corporate benchmarks for the private sector and World Benchmarking Alliance is one attempt. And now, Gerda, you are looking at me. I will stop <laughs> here and smiling. rather answer some questions. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Please take a seat. We have, we have, we have all these. Uh, find, find a seat. Make it, make it, your, make it comfortable to yourself. So, we need to give uh, two uh, uh, micros for uh, for the questions uh, uh, almost uh, to come. But um, thank you so much. Um, it is. It is. It is, we have to expect uh, uh, revolutionary uh, ideas and suggestions, but I hope they are very pra uh, uh, pragmatic when the report is, uh, is, is launched. Um, and indeed, I think it is crucial that all different stakeholders are at the table to discuss the how to, uh, to get there, because it will be necessary. Um, next uh, speaker will be Katie Dane, and Katie Dane is the CEO um, of the non communicable disease, uh, Diseases Alliance, and we have requested uh, her to talk about what she expects from the different stakeholders, how they have to um, behave, what they have to do, how they have to operate in order to find uh, sustainable and durable solutions. Katie, you have the floor. Thank you, Gerda, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, so I'm from the NCD Alliance, so I, I focus on issues such as um, the spiralling levels of obesity around the world, uh, the 500 million people living with diabetes, um, increasing levels of cancer, um, which is really the focus of the UN high-level meeting um, later this year in September in New York, the third high-level meeting. Um, one of the, the things that we have done as the NCD Alliance over the years is um, previously we always focused on unhealthy diets as a risk factor to NCDs. And about three years ago, we recognized with many different civil society organizations that we needed to shift our approach to really look at malnutrition in all its forms, given that 88% of countries are dealing with some form... Slow. <laughs> some form of malnutrition in their countries. Um, which includes obviously things like um, overweight and obesity, anemia um, and stunting. One of the kind of hallmarks that we have seen in terms of the NCD response over the years has been this focus on a multi-sectoral approach. Um, and this is really reflected within the sustainable development goals as well, this focus that no one sector, no one stakeholder can do this alone. Governments have to be at the helm, but they have to work with different parts of government, not just health. Um, they have to work with civil society, they have to work with private sector. But I think increasingly in the NCD space, what we're also up against is the fact that the diseases that we work with and we work on are, are in some ways driven by certain parts of the private sector. 
we always refer to the private sector as some kind of homogenous blob uh, that is all the same, when actually we're talking about very different parts of the private sector. Um, and increasingly, there's a bit of differentiation between what's being called the kind of unhealthy commodity industries. Big food, big tobacco has been there for a long time, and big alcohol being seen as part of the problem, as, as Gerda um, mentioned earlier. Um, so, also increasingly what's being looked at is how these different unhealthy commodity industries are actually working. And there's an increasing recognition that big food and big alcohol are almost learning and drawing from the same playbook that the tobacco industry has used over the years. Tactics such as using front groups to push their, their messages and their evidence. Um, really undermining the, the science that is out there in terms of the, the policy interventions that we know work. Interfering in policy making at the UN and within governments, uh, to name just a few. So within the NCD space, we're increasingly being a little bit cautious of the way that we do work with the private sector, which I think is really relevant for these discussions on malnutrition in all its forms. Because I think the way that the NCD community has worked with the private sector and the undernutrition community has worked with the private sector has been quite different. And if we're going to be working together, um, we do need to be thinking about these slight challenges um, that working with the private sector has. Um, one of the kind of new definitions and kind of concepts that has been really pushed recently is this idea of the commercial determinants of health, which again really looks at these kind of multinationals. But it's really, really clear in the food space anyway that you've got the kind of the good, the bad and the ugly in terms of the private sector. You can't just look at it as one homogenous block. You have to... Um, I'm getting the look. Um, you have to... Um, you have to be differentiated and you have to be very careful. And just one last point just to make in terms of what we've learned in, in NCDs is that there's a really clear divide in the, the way that private sector is engaged in, um, at the table. So tobacco industry has always been completely kept out. You know, Article 5.3 in the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control says tobacco industry has no role in policy making. Big, big difference in, in the rest of NCDs, particularly food and alcohol, where there's no Article 5.3 for big food and big alcohol, which means that we're seeing at some points uh, the, the real encroachment of industry in policy making, which is really difficult, particularly in low-middle-income countries. So I'll leave it there as some controversial points to, to kind of pick up later. Thanks. Very good. A few cliffhangers is always good for uh, to feed the discussion. Yes. Thank you so much. Last but certainly not least, as a panelist, I'm happy to introduce Francesco Branca. He's uh, uh, the director um, of nutrition of WHO. No, we have uh, keep the one for the for the for the questions. Um, Francesco, yesterday you were also uh, at the breakfast. Could you uh, provide us some clear messages of how WHO, but maybe also other UN organisations, can support at country level to tackle the double burden of malnutrition? how the need, there is the need to especially focus on girls and women, and how the decade of action on nutrition could be of help. Yeah, thank you, Gerda, and uh, good afternoon, uh, uh, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's a great opportunity to uh, highlight this issue. We have a World Health Assembly that is discussing some critical issues, and as you probably know, there's, uh, again, uh, quite a lot of... Uh, um, somehow uh, emotional discussion about early nutrition. And, uh, and I think the double burden really uh, em embodies these complexities. Uh, you heard, you know, in a family in Pakistan, you have the child with malnourished and an adult uh, who is, who is overweight. And actually, that adult overweight was a malnourished child because biologically, the two uh, conditions are linked. But, you know, what can we do about that? Uh, first of all, we need to be aware of the situation. It needs to be described. So the data part is absolutely critical. And then health workers need to know about it. They need to be uh, trained to describe. So uh, simply you know, looking at the growth charts, health workers normally look at the dots underneath the curve. They need to look at, start looking at the dots above the curve. That's the important message. And then what can you do? I mean, we have to look at existing we have to look at exist. Sorry, I, I get carried out by the enthusiasm. Yeah. <laughs> you have to um, look at the existing programs and review them so that they can really uh, affect positively both forms of malnutrition. 
we have to review the way we address moderate acute malnutrition. We have to review school feeding programs. We have to give the right food in school feeding programs, not necessarily focusing on the energy. We have to reconsider the way the social protection programs are done. But then we can strengthen certain programs which, we are going, which are going to affect positively both functions, starting from conception, starting from the girls, starting from adolescent girls. Adolescent nutrition is the secret for success for the prevention of both undernutrition and overweight. And then antenatal care. I mean, women have to go to antenatal care. Five visits, please, now. Not only one, five. And then infant and young child feeding, promoting, protecting, supporting breastfeeding, having all hospital implementing the baby-friendly hospital initiative. It's not an exceptional. It's not a luxury for high-income countries. It's something that should be a standard for quality of care for whole hospitals. And then complementary feeding, making sure that whatever we have in terms of complementary food is nutritious, is not too high in sugar or fat, but it's the right type of food. And finally, and this is really intersectoral, the food system. The food system is probably the solution. It's where health, agriculture should collaborate to create a healthy food environment. All right, thank you so much. Sit down, please, yes. You have one micro too much. Um, I'll give it to the, who's, who's the other uh, uh, question taker? Yes, thank you so much. Sonia, may I invite you to sit over there and to be a member of our panel? And we know that, oh, sorry. Francesco and uh, Sonia have to uh, leave a little bit early, about 1.15, so 10 minutes uh, before time. Um, it's not a lack of uh, interest, they wouldn't dare, but um, it is just that they have other obligations and we understand. You have a busy, you also, you also have to, okay. Um, um, Madam Golden also has to, uh, has to leave. But we continue with, uh, with the, 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 the other uh, panelists and I'm quite sure that we have enough to discuss. I want you, if you want to take the floor, to stand up, say your name, and be very uh, uh, concise, brief, short, and to the point, and address your question or your comment to comment to one of the panelists so that uh, you get a direct uh, answer. We take three or four, and then we take a second round. Who is the first who would like to take the floor? Always difficult. Yeah, stand up. Hi, all. Uh, I would like to, I'm Dilka from uh, Sri Lanka, working for World Vision and represent the civil society organization. So I would also like to uh, share with you a uh, uh, multi-sector approach, uh, what uh, the government introduced to address the nutrition, uh, sorry, non-communicable diseases in the country. So there, uh, I see a challenge in the country for the moment because we have the uh, undernutrition plus the Overnutrition, especially among women, if we take 45% of women uh, now becoming overweight and obese. So it's a big issue. Plus the wasting also is an uh, issue. So for those to tackle the non-communicable diseases and uh, the undernutrition as well, came up with a uh, multi-sectorial action plan. It is interministerial action plan. Uh, however, uh, the challenge is the sustainability of these plans because the priorities, priorities of these um, other ministries it's are becoming, not there. It's becoming a contribution right now. What's so your point and to whom do you want to address it? Yeah, how, my, my uh, question is uh, who can support uh, for the, uh, to the sustainability of this example like UN or some focal point has to... Um, uh, take this forward. So how uh, we can support and to prioritize various uh, sectors. Sometimes agriculture, it is not a priority. Education, it's not a priority. So who should play that role? Yeah. Prioritizing. Who should, yeah. Who should play the convening role when it comes uh, to bring partners around the table in order to collaborate? Thank you very much. Um, who next? So en um, français for. Uh, Ooh, the, oui. That's a challenge for me as well. Do you all have? Uh, <laughs> Ah, Patricia, but we can make, we can ask you to talk in English. Oh, no. No. Yes. 
Oui, merci. Je voudrais encore saluer les panélistes. Et je pense que nous, euh, Francesco parlait tout à l'heure de la visibilité qu'il faut donner à la nutrition, c'est-à-dire euh, être conscient. Mais être conscient comment Parce que je, je, je vois, c'est bien que l'Assemblée, les, les points sur la nutrition soient inscrits à l'Assemblée mondiale de la santé. Je vois qu'en Côte d'Ivoire, ça a été très difficile de mener le combat multisectoriel de la nutrition. Ça a pris du temps. Et avec les échanges avec les autres pays qui n'ont pas encore porté assez haut la nutrition pour une meilleure, une meilleure coordination, c'est difficile. Alors comment mettre en place ce réseau On peut encore plus appuyer les pays à prendre conscience parce que les ministres même n'assistent même pas au point euh, qui est mis à l'ordre du jour pour l'Assemblée mondiale. C'est encore les points focaux nutrition. Nous, en fait, peut-être nous, pas moi, pas, pas moi aujourd'hui, mais étant... Euh, à la santé, j'ai eu des difficultés à faire passer la nutrition, la malnutrition comme un problème de santé. Yeah. Yeah, voilà. you're a very eloquent speaker, I can tell. You're a very eloquent speaker and you can continue on for the next three minutes, but your question is uh, is clear. Um, how can also WHO make a clear space to discuss nutrition and bring the different players to uh, the table in order to sit together and to develop something? It's for you, uh, Francesco. Yes, please. Uh, oh, sorry, I had to budge in. I have to also go earlier. Uh, I am uh, Sultana from Bangladesh, and also with the Civil Society Alliance and Network and XWHO. The reason I said XWHO, because uh, I just want to give one information and to take into account, and that is, you, I don't know how many people of you heard about DOHAD, Developmental Origin of Adult Disease. That was originated in WHO in 2000, uh, the 20, uh, 21 or 2001 or two or something like that when Barker was alive. Unfortunately, David Barker died and David Barker's hypothesis was fetal origin of adult disease and all, a lot of evidence base that a, a child born low birth weight or they do not been taken into during adolescence pregnancies we, is the risk factor for getting adult disease. So I would just request that whether we can strategize in some way to put into this DOHAD a developmental origin of adult disease and the Barker's hypothesis of fetal origin of adult disease into our policies so that we can prevent and treat or prevent both undernutrition and overnutrition. Okay, Thank and you. that's the target. I'm afraid you have to explain the system of the thought a little bit uh, more. Unless Sanya Nishtar understands everything about it, then I address the question to her. You can Google it maybe. No, no, not yet. But I want to take one or two uh, more questions. Um, and I would like to, um, wh what is your, what's your background? I'm an intern at the World Health You're Organization. An intern at the? The World Health Organization. Okay, you have the floor. Who do you address your question to? Um, the lady all the way on the left, please. Madam Gold, yes. Um, you talked earlier about um, family eating patterns and the importance of a supportive and positive environment. Um, but one thing I wanted to question you about is addressing affordability and the disparities between healthy food, especially as we talk about like in the US. For example, you know, the cost of strawberries might be way more expensive than potato chips. and it do, and at a certain point in time, it doesn't matter if you're eating together with your family if the only thing that you can afford at the table is something that's not healthy. Thank you very much. One more, then, then, then we have five. Hi, I'm Alice Granger Gosser. I'm here with uh, Framework Convention Alliance. My question is for Katie. I wanted to congratulate you for bringing up the point of the commercial determinants of disease and ask you to expand. A little bit closer to the micro, please. Expand perhaps on what the mechanisms in the absence of something like Article 5.3 would be for dealing with the interference of the food industry in policy making. Yeah. Okay. Let me start uh, to uh, invite uh, Gunnild Stordale uh, to answer the question of Sri Lanka. Who do you, how do you uh, organize all players around the table in order to get 
the diet's right to prevent undernutrition and overnutrition? Well, that is, uh, <laughs> that is a good question, uh, answering a bit biased, because that is uh, why we set up EAT as a, as a neutral platform science-led uh, to provide a safe space where you can have all these difficult questions addressed and, and have, uh, have an environment where we actually can, can disagree but also uh, agree on that science needs to lead, lead us. And one, one of the things that is coming out of the Eat Lancet discussion, which is also relevant for the other questions uh, about uh, how we address these, these issues uh, is true cost accounting or at least the cost of action versus inaction of food systems. Because obviously the, the food or all that we know that food is a bigger threat to health than all other addictive substances such as alcohol, tobacco and drugs combined. Uh, the food industry is basically not regulated beyond food safety. And the, unfortunately, the cheapest uh, food is often the most unhealthy and also unsustainable. And in order to shift that, we cannot only rely upon private sector action. Obviously, if they are changing too fast in the f existing framework, they are not going to make profit. So even though they know what to do, they just don't know how to make profit once they do it. And they also are not able to compete uh, with other actors <laughs> that still produce greasy and, and, and healthy stuff. So in order for, for us to move forward, we need enabling policies uh, from governments and also international uh, regulations that actually are, are addressing this and, and help uh, the, the right, the healthy and sustainable food to be also uh, the... the um, affordable and available uh, for all. I would like, thank you so much, I would like to ask Dr. Um, Stanek Zar to um, answer your own question that you put on the table. You ask for alignment uh, of the investors on food, the different players, but how as a government do you bring the people together in order to ask for alignment, to organize alignment, because that's about the same question. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much. <coughs> this is a very important issue. First of Close all, Close to your... Yeah. First of all, uh, it's very important that the, the government should take the responsibility and the ownership of the program. One thing that we have achieved at our level is that, you know, we, first of all, at the Ministry of Health level, we upgraded the Department of Public Nutrition. It was a small department. But, you know, after you know, realizing the importance of that department, now this is upgraded to the directorate level. This is one issue, and second, the nutrition issue is now part of the policy of the government of Afghanistan. It's a priority of the government of Afghanistan. And beside that, we you know, consider the importance and the vital role of the multi-sectoral approach. So for the first time, there is a, a national uh, multi-sectoral committee uh, established in Afghanistan, which is, you know, uh, in including the Ministry of uh, uh, higher education, Minister of Agriculture, Minister of Women Affairs, Minister of Public Health, and also other line ministries. So they are you know, considering uh, the health and nutrition issues as a multi-sectoral issues. This committee is established and this is at a higher level chaired by His Excellency the President and also the CEO of Afghanistan regularly in taking charge of the progress and the implementation of the issues. That's very important. And also, you know, we also consider that you know, the multi-sectoral issues at the Ministry of Health level brought together all the partners, including the UN agencies like WHO, UNICEF, you know, the other international and local organizations that are working to you know, uh, improve. But still, you know, the challenges are in front of us that we would like to you know, uh, convert it to realities. You know, that they should be the, with this one sound, move forward and consider that this health is you know, a multi-sectoral issue behind the Minister of Health only. Very good. So, thank thank you. you so much. Uh, Francesco Branca, we heard already from Sanya Nishtar that nutrition uh, a few years ago in Pakistan, Pakistan was somewhere in a very dark corner so that nobody needed to be responsible for it. And here we have a, a Sun Movement focal point from Ivory Coast, from Cote d'Ivoire, who really asks uh, WHO how to make space for um, paying more attention to nutrition? Well, first of all, 
you have here an ally. I have the same problem in his organization. Mm -hmm. So uh, four things. Number one, make sure that uh, everybody remembers that nutrition is a pillar of primary health care. It's a pillar of universal health coverage. We have a list of essential nutrition actions which should be part of the package of health services. We want to have coverage of those services. Number two, make sure that this costing of these different components, because Minister, eventually, we'll have to decide what comes in. And then we know that some of those actions are cost effective, but you have all the costings done for the programs. Number three, the human resources. You have to have really the capacity building of health workers, particularly now in this new uh, you know, era of universal coverage, nutrition has to be there in their package. And uh, number four, the supplies. Make sure that nutrition products are in the essential medicine list. They're not there. We're, we're working on that. Okay, thank you so much. That, that brings us to the bridge of um, food that is healthy. Can you give the micro to Madam Golden? Because she needs to answer the question not about accessibility, but about affordability. Very good. I think that is one of the big issues. There are actually two components to that. I think having affordable food is truly a critical issue. But the second thing is getting good uptake, and you referred to that, in terms of we have a lot of patterns throughout the world in terms of what are our comfort foods, what are, what are we accustomed to eating, and it's sometimes very hard to change those patterns even when foods are accessible and, and a more moderate price. So we need to think of this in a much broader spectrum. It does need to be around affordability, and, and nutritious foods, but we also need to be considering what is it that we do to social norm the actual healthy food processes and how we interact with food in a successful and positive way. Because I think that way then we end up with programs where we learn to buy and prepare our foods, we learn to grow our foods, we learn to select wisely. And I think that we need to look at nutrition from that perspective as well. And I do think private sector and public sector have roles in that. Thank you. I think so too, because they are very good marketeers, as Katie Dane already made clear. But Katie, you have a concrete question. Please get the micro. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Francesco. <laughs> uh, so to Alice's question about um, it, it, in the current context where you know we don't have a Article 5.3 in terms of keeping industry outside of policy making from a alcohol and a food perspective and many others, and I don't think we're going to get that anytime soon because that requires a, a framework convention and there's very little political appetite for something like that. But I think the first thing that governments can be doing to, when there isn't that clear divide between industry and policy is just having a really clear understanding of actually what the role of private sector is um, from an NCD and a malnutrition in all its forms perspective. And there needs to be a really clear understanding that there's a difference between uh, private sector's role in implementation versus its role in policy development. And we have always argued that private sector has absolutely no role in policy development. It's up to governments. It should be led by governments. It should be governments at the helm. Yes, governments can consult with different stakeholders when they're developing policy, and they often do, including civil society. But when it's actually deciding upon that policy, it should be completely government-led and government-owned. And that's where I think sometimes we're, we're going wrong at times, when industry is very much at the front and centre. You're such a native speaker that you that you speed up all the time in, in answering. Isn't that why you invited me? No. <laughs> <laughs> so finalised, but slower, um, please. And then the other, the other way that I think we can address this without Article 5.3 is actually understanding how, what industry tactics are being used and being able to monitor, monitor those very well. I think in the tobacco control space, advocates have done a very good job of actually understanding how the tobacco industry uh, is approaching in terms of trying to undermine public health policy. Um, in food, I think we, need, we could do a lot more in terms of actually tracking what strategies and what tactics they're using. Because I think it's fair to say that you know, the lobbying budgets of industry are absolutely huge when you compare it to our public health budgets. I mean, it makes ours look like peanuts. It's kind of like the da da David versus Goliath kind of scenario. But the better we can actually understand how industry is trying to interfere 
the more we can be proactive and on the front foot, perhaps. Thank you very much. I'd like to, uh, Sonia, uh, Sonia Nishtar, um, to see whether there are takeaways already from this first round of contributions and questions for your important work at the, uh, at the Commission on Obesity and NCDs, or whether you would like to share some experiences with us on the topics that were raised until now. Well, I think the takeaways for the Commission are that there are very important synergies to be exploited. Uh, and that the malnutrition agenda is at the heart of the NCD agenda as well, both on the uh, over, um, uh, overweight and obesity end of the spectrum, but also at the undernutrition end of the spectrum. Uh, and I just want to reflect back and circle back to the excellent point made by Sultana uh, about the Barker hypothesis, because we know very clearly um, that the biological and the behavioral response of a child to the obesogenic environment uh, is shaped by processes that start even before birth. So if the child has suffered from intrauterine malnutrition, um, you know, there are different epigenetic factors that come into play. That child uh, responds very differently to um, uh, you know, to sedentariness, to overeating. Um, we know that there is a huge um, epigenetic influence on the behavioral side as well. Uh, I mean, you talked about, you know, how the family eaten, eating patterns are transferred from generation to generation. Uh, and in fact, some of these novel aspects of obesity uh, we addressed in the Ending Childhood Obesity Commission, which I had the privilege of co-chairing. Uh, so in the commission report, we clearly outlined that obesity is not just a product of the obesogenic environment. It's not just a product of sedentariness and a product of uh, uh, eating unhealthiness, but that there are some strong developmental factors. So the takeaway from me, Gerda, very simply no, is... No, you, because you don't, you don't go yet. You have a second round of takeaways. So take a few, and then uh, the second <laughs> okay. round, because okay. we'll, keep it, uh, we'll keep you here until the, the finish of the second round. Okay. <laughs> All right. Yeah? So t give us one or two takeaways already. So, um, so I think, uh, the, as I said, and repeating myself, the takeaway is about the importance of the synergies, both uh, across the spectrum. Uh, the other important takeaway is that multi-stakeholder institutional arrangements are difficult to set up, and that countries are uh, continue to be in a fix about where to pin responsibility and uh, who ought to take a lead. Uh, and, that's, uh, and that is something we are grappling with in the NCD space as well, uh, okay. as, as Katie and Francesco will bear okay. me out. Thank you so much. We, I think we can make it to have a second round with the full panel, and then we will have a third. You have to leave right now. Okay. We have a, with a semi-full panel, and you <laughs> attend to, to ah, okay. You have to leave right now as well. I, I have a meeting. Okay, of course, but then you should uh, share all your takeaways. <laughs> I thought we would have you for another round. Uh, okay. Do you have more takeaways? So I, I, I think listening from your, uh, you know, reflecting back on the breakfast yesterday, and um, uh, one important takeaway is that there is a willingness on part of countries to, to act. Hmm. Uh, there's a willingness on their part to share experiences. Yeah. Uh, and that you should continue to provide the space for convening. Uh, another important takeaway is, has actually been, um, uh, you know, reiterated by a colleague from Afghanistan. Um, he made a very important point, and I think that's a very key message for the international community. Because in the developing country settings, we see international actors come with their own specific agendas and carve out vertical spaces. We understand that you have to be accountable to, especially the bilaterals have to be accountable to their parliaments. They want very clear targets and accountabilities for delivery on that. Uh, so there is little convergence at a country level and there, is, there continues to be a tendency to start de novo. Yeah. Uh, and that is detrimental to progress. Uh, a, a, and I must give you credit for raising this. So that, I think that's another very clear. Very good. Thank takeaway. you very much. We let you go, but we give you a big hand. And thank you for joining thank us. You.
And by the way, we keep an eye on you for your work in this, uh, in this, this commission because we support you and we want you to make it an, an incredible, good resulting uh, committee. Thank you. Uh, second round, five questions, and we have three panelists, but they are, they are very much uh, to the point. Yeah. Yeah. Madam, please stand up. Give us your name and address your question. All right. Good afternoon. I'm Sharon from Zambia, um, in charge of NCDs. I think part of it was covered by Katie, but I still feel that the aspect of regulation of and healthy foods, of um, sweetened beverages as well, becomes an issue not only to the private sector, but also the governments that are getting um, money through taxes and all. So how do we balance that we will put these laws and they will also lead to loss of income um, and that the private sector complies as well? Excellent. Thank you so much. These are the questions. Here we go. Yeah, please stand up. Yeah. Hello, I'm Louise Meinke. I'm Head of Policy and Public Affairs at World Cancer Research Fund International. Um, Gunhild, I want to just um, challenge you a little bit more on what you said about the comprehensive enabling policies to help companies to make healthy food profitable in line with what was said before. Would you not agree that is the prime role and responsibility of government to protect, promote and fulfill the right of people and communities and their right to health and nutrition rather than promoting policies that enable, government, uh, enable private sector to make profits? And on that note as well, Katie, how would you respond to the question of enabling policies to make profit? Thank you so much. I like these questions. Thank you very much. Gerda, great. Uh, first of all, fantastic to host this week of Nutrition Hub. It's very exciting. My, name my is people and my team, so if you would uh, yeah. praise them, I'm happy to yeah, share with them. Fantastic, really. First time ever. Very exciting. My name is Barbara Bultz. Uh, I run a boutique advisory group which focuses on building new constellations and building multi-sectoral partnerships. And I have a question for Gunhild. I was very thrilled when you mentioned the two degrees uh, in the planet uh, that Johan and his planetary boundaries came about. What about having something like that? for food and nutrition, because I see constant challenges when we are building multi-sectoral partnership. There is a lack of, uh, it's too slow. It's, uh, it's an urgency, we need to act. And can we find something that it's simple to understand? You know, like the Olympic circus, ab above the Olympic circus, one goal. And we as humans, unfortunately, we need uh, to be threatened sometimes, you know, to be scared. Uh, it's very unfortunate, but then we act. So how, what can we come up with through the commission, through the work that Sanya is doing, what uh, uh, Francesco is doing? I mean, you are all exceptional leaders coming together. Can we come up with something that really um, embeds this urgency to move faster and collaborate better? Thank you. Thank you so much. Two more questions, yes. Hi, uh, Michael Elias from the UK. Um, I previously worked uh, for a nutrition donor, but currently working outside the nutrition space. So my question is for Katie. Um, the US trade representative a couple of months ago talked about uh, basically including in the NAFTA renegotiations um, objections to food labeling by a number of countries, and that was also brought up by a number of other trade representatives. So how do we ensure that the regulatory space to tackle the commercial determinants of health isn't negotiated away outside of health forums? Yeah, excellent questions. How do we keep the decision making at the table where it needs to be? The government table. One final question. Nobody, you, you can, you can, you can uh, count on the third round, I'm quite sure. Um, very dedicated questions. Uh, first, Katie, please answer the questions on the taxes and regulations and the impact of private sector 
etc. And we also come to you, so you don't just relax, uh, stay sharp, because we keep you committed. I guess first in terms of the question around kind of regulation and, and taxation, one, one of the things that um, is clear in terms of the evidence around taxing of tobacco taxation has been around for a long time, but there's now an increased focus on alcohol taxation as well as taxation on sugary sweetened beverages. Um, and many, many countries around the world now moving in that direction. Obviously, Mexico upheld as one of the, the kind of front leaders, the UK more recently, and many others. But I think one of the important things from an NCD perspective on taxation um, of unhealthy commodities is that, first and foremost, it's actually an intervention to reduce consumption. Um, and then we can also look at it as a way of uh, resource mobilization. But first and foremost, it's actually a way of reducing consumption of sugary drinks over the years and therefore uh, their, their role in fueling obesity. So. I think seeing taxation as a public health intervention um, first and foremost and then seeing it later as a potentially a resource mobiliser for countries is, is important. Um, secondly, in terms of the question around the sense of how you can create that kind of sense of urgency, I mean, I think it's, it's one that we have uh, been uh, challenged with over the years with NCDs just because they are they're kind of the slow burn issues in global health. It's not like HIV AIDS where you create that sense of kind of urgency and fear. Um, you don't have that for, for, for NCDs. Um, but I think the way that you can create a sense of urgency is actually, actually by kind of mobilizing people, by consumers, because they have the power in terms of really, you know, they're the taxpayers, they are the kind of ones that, you know, vote at the, the polling station for their, for their politicians. So if you can actually really make it front and center of people, which is difficult from an NCD and a malnutrition in all its forms. I mean, it's a horrible phrase, isn't it? You're not going to have Joe Bloggs on the street talking about either NCDs or malnutrition in all its forms in all seriousness. But you are going to have people talking very seriously about obesity and obesogenic environments and making it very kind of front and centre of what people see and, and, and do and therefore voting with voting on, on those issues as well. I'll come back to the other questions in a sec. Yeah. Which, which one? You, uh, first, uh, this lady, yeah, because yeah. she wanted to challenge you a little bit more. And, and I, I mean, I totally agree with you. I'm not saying that we should uh, develop comprehensive policies for private sector to make profit as such. Profit on making the right products. That is the whole thing. Because if we, and this goes also back to the economic case for action here, because right now, there's no one that has an overview. No one knows what uh, inaction on food system is costing our countries and us the, the world as a whole, right? Uh, so because there are so many hidden costs, uh, so many uh, hidden externalities, so governments around the world unfortunately end up subsidizing uh, what makes us sick and also uh, destroys the planet. But if you have, uh, and that is something actually that is now um, in the making as a follow-up of the Eat Lancet Commission to do uh, what is the economic implication of this. If we started to act by preventing diseases, uh, preventing malnutrition in all its forms and also preventing environmental uh, damage what would the cost savings be? Because money talks also for governments. And if you see the true cost of food uh, and the big picture, then it is no, it's no way uh, that business as, uh, as usual is possible. Because then you have to start to regulate. Then we can't have a discussion about a tiny, tiny sugar tax that is not going to make anything uh, change at, at scale. But we need comprehensive taxes and regulations, but also start subsidizing the right things that we need to produce more of. Because, I mean, farmers uh, and, and private sectors are like most of us. They are, they are simple. Uh, people and they want to make whatever makes them profit, right? So what I'm saying by the it needs to be sustainable from an economic perspective for private sector is that we need to acknowledge that if the companies go bankrupt, they can't do anything, right? So that is why we need these enabling policies and things need to happen in parallel. Thank you very much. And now how do we raise the sense of urgencies? Katie had already an ID, but... Well, a lot I, of I, think, there. I think if you can measure it, you can change it, right? And, and for food systems, we, we don't have science-based uh, science or scientific targets 
at the moment. And obviously, if we start, if we start looking into what will the food system have to look like in order for us to deliver on the sustainable development goals in 12 years time and in Paris in 2050, what will that look like and how, what will need to happen now? And then we can make the pathways uh, and a plan to get there. So I think starting to measure and also develop uh, accountability mechanisms so we actually can track and monitor progress will really uh, bring up the, the sense of urgency for everyone. And also, I mean, I'm, I'm not saying that it's one single bullet uh, that will fix this. We need a variety of different measures and we need to collaborate with all the stakeholders from farm to fork and down the waste bin really around the table. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Stanekzar. I think in case, yeah, we go to the third round, eh, but uh, one, uh, we have to, um, Mr. Stanekzar, um, there will be companies who knock on the door of the uh, Afghanistan uh, uh, government to invest in your country. How do you engage uh, with the private sector in order to make sure that they align from the very beginning and they, that they contribute to the solution rather than to the problem of malnutrition in all its forms? Yeah. <coughs> yeah. Thank you very much. I think this is Slow, very please, very loud <coughs> and clear. <coughs> Otherwise, we won't have interpreters uh, at all anymore. Yeah. I think this is very important. As we all know that you know, global globalization is, you know, behind all these ten changes. So trade is capturing and increasing quite you know, uh, quickly, you know, crossing all the borders. Despite of the conflicts, you know, the trans, uh, you know, transnational food companies are approaching us, knocking our door. We already have the, the, the signs and evidences of you know, the multinational or trans, uh, uh, transnational food companies in Afghanistan, they started. And this is, you know, uh, uh, critical because from the global evidences, you know, that when these companies are you know, expanding, they are, you know, purchasing the small companies, the small markets, and they are going to increase the availability of unhealthy food. And one problem with unhealthy food is that they are with low prices. So it gave more chance for the people to, to reach to the unhealthy food, and it contributes to the, uh, uh, directly to the increase of the incidence. Maybe one of the reasons, and also in our countries, and also not only in my country, but in also in other uh, low and middle income countries because of the availability of uh, transnational food companies, like, you know, uh, McDonald's, you know, like, you know, uh, other type of you know, companies, they are providing the food with low cost. So what is the responsibility of the global community? I was uh, willing to see, you know, the representative of WTO here, because we are studying a lot in the documents that there is synergies is coming closer and they are going to work together WTO and WTO because one is looking for the trade and one is looking for health so they have to become together to in conver convergence to bring convergence and synergy that we should look for the same goal for the health not otherwise you know they will look for benefits and they will look for health so there will be a lot of gaps between in these two and we will not reach so at the result you know the incidence of NCD will increase as it's increasing. But there are also good examples of the countries that they already address this issue, like United Kingdom, like Brazil, like you know, uh, maybe other you know, uh, low middle income countries, they achieved. So uh, we are lucky that because we are learning from the experience of a global community, we are addressing this through this multi-sectoral uh, committee, and also uh, we be Afghanistan also become okay. the member of the WTO. So now this is the right time to be very sensitive, to be cautious, to subsidize the healthy food, and also to tax the unhealthy food. Full stop. Thank you. If you give the advisor to the minister the floor, he continues. Very good. Thank you so much. Third and final round. So if you take your opportunity right now, how many hands do I see? Yeah, one, two, three, four. Yeah, excellent. Yes, um, really, really interesting, really important. Um, Marita Johansson, Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs and uh, Focal Point for Nutrition. Consequences, shock therapy, um, urgency. I think this is something that really needs to be uh, well documented, what are the consequences of inaction in this area? I don't think that 
what is being discussed here today is being given enough visibility. I don't think it's recognized, certainly in the humanitarian sphere where I work, the importance of food systems. We hear about climate change, we hear about consequences of that. But what are the consequences um, in humanitarian terms, in SDG terms, of inaction on the food systems front. I think this is a big issue and I think it's something that's lacking. Thank you. Yeah. I think I'll give this uh, one to uh, Gunnild. Gunnild, you have your first uh, question. Sir, please stand up. Moi, je voudrais tout juste partager parce que nous, nous avons adhéré au mouvement SAN. Maintenant, au sein du SAN, il y a l'USBN. L'USBN et le gain. On travaille avec eux. C'est quoi ça C'est le partenariat avec le secteur privé. Il y a déjà un draft sur le partenariat gagnant-gagnant avec le secteur privé. Nous, du côté national et international, on a donné l'opportunité que les privés peuvent produire, que ce soit les farines enrichies, tout ce qui est nutritionnel, et on les supporte. C'est un grand marché pour le pays international. Au lieu des cagoutés bourratifs qui ne donnent rien, Mais ça, on est même prêt à donner le logo à l'Alliance nationale pour la fortification alimentaire et on est prêt à soutenir les produits de ces secteurs privés et c'est un grand marché. Et c'est ça le partenaire gagnant-gagnant. Nous gagnons avec les valeurs nutritives, eux ils gagnent sur le marché commercial. Donc c'est ça qu'on a déjà initié avec l'USBN, ce qu'est l'INAP Nutrition. Merci. Representative of Madagascar, and with SBN, because I don't like uh, acronyms, but SBN is the Sun Business Network that is available for countries who want to uh, involve the private sector and is uh, supporting to bring the uh, private sector companies together. There was another hand raised. If yeah, please. Thank you, Gerda. Arsalai, uh, focal point uh, from Afghanistan. Uh, I got three questions. Uh, first, uh, uh, I would like to hear your experience how to, uh, how to balance uh, between the food quality and support of the food industry. Uh, we have uh, established a multi-sectoral, uh, multi-level, multi-stakeholders platform. In Afghanistan, as my colleague mentioned before, uh, recently in one of the meetings where private sector was sitting there, uh, members of the uh, that, uh, committee raised concern about uh, 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 energy drinks in the market. So we only want it because you know Afghanistan is a fragile country. If you have three questions, you have to speed up. Eh? Uh, okay. Yeah. Will... <laughs> so uh, we strongly need, badly need uh, engagement of uh, private sector and we would like to uh, support them. But as soon as we uh, uh, raised that issue, uh, they were uh, allergic against it and uh, didn't want even uh, to hear complaints about energy drinks in the market. So I would like to uh, hear from you people. And second, uh, is uh, addressing nutrition cannot only be achieved and reached in a country. We need uh, regional cooperation as well global. So uh, we got globally now, Sun is uh, helping, but regional is missing a mechanism. So that's another. And number three is, uh, as my colleague mentioned, that Afghanistan, because of the circumstances there, we are mostly dependent on uh, it. So, in Afghanistan, agriculture is not developed. We are importing 93% of our products from abroad, especially from our neighbor countries. How can we have control over their quality? Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. One final burning question. Is there still a burning question? All right. Thank you. Uh, so I have one uh, question, one regarding to the snack food for the children. Who are you addressing the question to? Uh, to you. To you. Yes. Who is Gunnild? Yes. Is Gunnild? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. Very good. Yes, yes, to yes. you. So you know, like uh, you know, the the WHO released this uh, six sixty point nine uh, sixty nine point nine resolutions uh, last year about this uh, complementary food, the regulation on the complementary food. 
when we discuss with the government in Cambodia uh, how you know they can implement that uh, they ask us you know like if there is any formula created for the safe uh, you know like uh, complementary food in the world that they can you know look at it so did you have some considerations at your level to come up with uh, you know formula for the snack food or you know, complimentary food for children. Okay. Yeah. They are requested by the, by the government to give good arguments how to prevent, uh, to do the marketing for uh, snack food for children. Start with, start with that one? Yes, please start with yeah. that one and then answer uh, uh, a few. Uh, you have each of you have two minutes yeah. and then I want to close with two minutes, mm. uh, yeah. a few conclusions. Mm. Two minutes. Well, and don't speak too fast. No. <laughs> Excellent question. Uh, and and obviously, uh, as eat, we we don't have the answers on how this should be developed at a detail level. That is up to governments and up to uh, stakeholders to to be part of. But we what we do is to to bring people together and and facil uh, facilitate collaboration. But obviously. I think this is where the comprehensive taxation and the comprehensive policy uh, mechanism really play an important role because once you have the science-led agenda, uh, and that is also more or less to your question, when you start looking into what are we producing, what are we importing, exporting, and what are we consuming, how can we as governments uh, facilitate the most, or, or and, and direct and align uh, over incentives and, and regulations in order for private sector actions to go towards what we want, products and, and food that is healthy and sustainable, and obviously bring into the human, humanitarian aspect, which is very important as well. So I think this is where, where, we, where we hope to see also um, and, and just to mention one initiative which is now being launched or announced tomorrow, which is the Food System Dialogues, which is a collaboration with World Economic Forum and the World Business Council for Sustainable Development and EAT. But we are just the initiators. We hope that many more will join. But that is an effort to have food system dialogues at all levels, from the global to the regional and to the national and even down to the city level, bringing stakeholders together and have these discussions. What will it take for, uh, from policy, but also what will be required for, from private sector? Because once you have the science-led agenda, and then, then private sector, obviously, they, they will also see that it's not an option to continue with pushing what makes people sick and, and destroys the planet. Gunild, I would like to invite you to answer the yeah, question of Marita, very short, whether, yeah. you should, whether we shouldn't uh, first uh, make uh, what the cost of uh, inaction is uh, for food systems, uh, for not ac acting in food systems for healthy food. Yeah, that, that is, uh, as I briefly mentioned, that is one of the, the things that we, and, and also other groups are talking about in action versus action on, on food systems at national level but also at the global level and and this will be one of the pieces uh, that is coming after the Eat Lancet to look into what is the cost of inaction versus action and proving the economic case and the stern review changed uh, the discussions on climate change because everybody realized that there's so much we can save if we act and mitigate rather than wait and adapt. And that is what we want to show as well with food systems. Okay. Thank and finally, you. can I just to the humanitarian piece? Yeah, well, but uh, no. you two minutes. Eh? No. Maybe, maybe Katie or maybe, uh, yeah. Katie, you, f you had some uh, questions. Sure. Or some answer. I, I guess just, just to build upon Gunhild's point about the, the economic arguments, I mean, I, I think um, in the NCD space for too long, we have been talking about. NCDs being a cost and an expenditure for governments, which they obviously are. I mean, we know that over two decades they cost um, the international community $47 trillion, um, which is just too big to get your head around. Um, but what we're doing increasingly now is actually talking about NCDs as a strategic and a smart investment for governments. And I think what's really neat about the malnutrition in all its forms agenda is that we're talking about double duty actions that really give double bang for your buck. 
um, in terms of undernutrition and obesity. And that's, that speaks quite powerfully, I think, not only to ministers of health, who are obviously important in these discussions, but it's also about the ministers of finance that we need to be kind of making the, making the case. In terms of the questions around kind of, you know, government engagement with the, the private sector, what do we want them to, to actually be doing in this space? And I'm talking about it, obviously, from more of an NCD obesity um, perspective. But, you know, in NCDs, what we've seen is that, you know, we want the private sector to be reformulating their products to make them more healthy, right? We want them to be reducing sugar. We want them to be reducing salt, et cetera. And I think the first way that governments do it is that it's the voluntary approaches of the private sector. They see, you know, with voluntary approaches, um, are we able to reformulate and improve the products to make them more healthy? But I think increasingly what we're seeing is that voluntary approaches, whilst the private sector love them um, and they push for them, they don't actually work in many cases. Um, and it's quite unique when voluntary approaches do work. And that's where we move to regulation. But in other ways that we need to see the private sector really stepping up from an obesity and an NCD perspective um, is things like restricting of, of marketing to, to children, um, whether it's in schools, whether it's on the TV, whether it's online, you know, having really clear restrictions that you know, children shouldn't be surrounded constantly by advertising and marketing of unhealthy products, where, where, which is the current kind of norm as it, was, um, as it is um, today. And then the other area that we're seeing great progress, you know, particularly with, in Latin America, for example, with, with Chile really kind of leading the way, is on you know, front-of-pack food labelling, really clear labelling so that consumers can make the choice and know what they're eating. And in so many countries, it's just too complicated. There's too much information or there's absolutely nothing there. Um, so actually going forward with some really pioneering kind of front-of-pack labelling that, that we need private sector and governments to be working on together. Okay. What are we absolutely missing here in one minute? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I'm, uh, first of all, first of all I'm uh, agree with the Ursula Isab from Afghanistan that really there, there should be a balance between the healthy and, and, and unhealthy food. And you, uh, the, the markets are you know, blooming. You know, there is huge, you know, uh, if you go to each corner of the country, there are energy drinks more visible than any other type of foods. So first of all, that's the, the, the job of the, the, the government. And also, beside that, the support of the regional and global communities. Thank that's you. That's very important. Especially for the low and middle income countries, we have to consider this. If you are not going to address it right now, then tomorrow it will be too late. Yeah. Because you know, it will you know, double the burden of the communicable disease and also non-communicable disease in, in low and middle income countries. So this is the right time, and I appreciate the comment of our Salisab, and please take it to your consideration, because not only local enforcement is required, but also global at, you know, attention is required to restrict the unhealthy food. Otherwise, you know, uh, as the evidence shows that uh, the number of diabetes increasing from you know, five, 10 million to 100 million, the same like you know, for, what, for what the cancers with other non-communicable disease, it will be uncontrollable. So this is our responsibility, and also the responsibility of the you know, World Health Organization, World Trade Organization, and all other partners to consider this very strictly. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, dear participants, I think we had um, a great group of participants, very active and very interactive on a very crucial and important topic. I don't have the illusion that we have all the solutions at hand right now. But I think we, have a, we made a good start uh, here, or a good start, a good step. And we were able to inspire each other. I would like to thank you as participants. I would like you to give the panel a big hand. But let me first know, yes, yes, do so. <laughs> But let me try to give you five points to think before. The first uh, takeaway is that uh, undernutrition and obesity and CDs have, can have same causes and should start with uh, better uh, care for adolescent girls and investment in women taking care of the first thousand days, both for undernutrition and for obesity and NCDs. That is the best start. The second takeaway is that 
Undernutrition and overnutrition, obesity and NCDs, can only be tackled if there is a multi-sectoral and multi-stakeholder collaboration and approach. The third takeaway, and that was brought to the table by Gunhild, when it comes to obesity and the marketing of unhealthy products, right now we only have regulations about food safety. And we don't have a lot of uh, food regulations when it comes to quality, food quality. So we should think about how to enrich the Codex Alimentarius, and hopefully the, uh, the committee, e Lancet Committee, can uh, do a lot here. The fourth takeaway is that um, the need to build a joint agenda needs to all stakeholders come to, a get to, the, to the table. We will not find solutions with turning our back to others and say just you have to uh, solve or you have to behave better, build a joint uh, agenda and um, including, um, including trade, international trade is crucial to also be brought to the table and to be considered as uh, right now as a part of the, of the problem and the challenges, but has to become also a part of the solution. And um, uh, last but certainly not least, and please take this also as a takeaway, um, when it comes to decision making, it is the government. It is always the government, and the government can be held responsible by uh, its own people because they are supposed to be democratically uh, uh, elected. They be can be held to account. It's the government that needs to own the challenge and that needs to be responsible and accountable for the decisions, but also needs to be responsible and accountable for finding and driving the solutions home. Thank you so much for joining us. We're very proud of you and very proud of our panelists. Thank you. See you later. And we're also very proud of our interpreters and our people.